what is going on? I am Greg Sussman, joined today by Jim Sonis of FanDuel. Week one almost in the books. Jim, how do you feel? I feel pretty good, Greg. It was fun to see actual football once again. It was fun to get some answers on what the workloads of various players are going to be and also see some players rise up boards. So uh, pretty good. I mean, there were some injuries, obviously, but um, not as bad as it could have been given the way the training camp worked out. So all things considered, I think it went about as well as it could have gone. As promised, I sat on my couch for nine straight hours, and there were highs, there were lows, but that's a standard fantasy football Sunday. So let's talk about some of the highs that we experienced from yesterday, and we'll begin with Las Vegas, and we start with Josh Jacobs, where people were concerned about, was he going to catch the ball out of the backfield? How effective was he going to be as a receiver? Where I feel like they kind of ignored that he was going to get all the carries in the backfield, and that means all the touchdowns out of the running back position. And Josh Jacobs was fantastic in week one. Yeah, and honestly, Greg, this isn't even about the touchdowns. I don't care about those. Like, touchdowns are cool, but give me targets, man. And Josh Jacobs got those. The two big numbers that I look at first when it comes to running backs are snap rate and target share. And Josh Jacobs set career highs in both snap rates and targets in week number one. He had six targets in week one. That was the highest he has ever had in his career. He had only topped three once the entirety of last year. So that's a major change, but also a 78% snap rate. That is a really good number. And Josh Jacobs, with all the carries, is a good running back. That's similar to Nick Chubb, similar to Joe Mixon. But when you get him targets on top of that, he suddenly gets himself into that like Zeke Elliott's Alvin Kamara type tier. And that's a very major difference from a fantasy perspective. Now, obviously, his his uh, value will not be as high as theirs because his offense is not as good. But you can get a lot of juice out of someone that they're going to get every single running back carry and get four to six targets on top of that. So Josh Jacobs moved up tiers this week and didn't move up positions. He moved up tiers from a redraft perspective. And that's going to pay huge dividends for daily fantasy. He becomes a higher floor asset, but also does boost his ceiling quite a bit. So Josh Jacobs, I think, could not have had a better role on Sunday. And I think he has someone we need to be really in on in the coming weeks. So I'm not going to go as far as you in saying I don't care about touchdowns because I do. They are awesome and they matter a lot. But they aren't as predictable necessarily as those targets, as that snap rate is. If we know Josh Jacobs is going to be on the field for every play, we know that Derek Carr is going to target him. We can rely on him more. The touchdowns, those three touchdown games won't always be there. But if we can get a day like yesterday where you're getting four to six targets and he's getting 100% of those running back carries, there's a lot more good days in store for Josh Jacobs. As we move on next, uh, I'll tell a quick story. Uh, Malcolm Brown cost me a fantasy week. Why? Because I drafted Malcolm Brown everywhere. And who did I start yesterday when Miles Sanders was ruled inactive? I started Uncle Len. Jim, I went with Leonard Fournette over Malcolm Brown. One person's stock is down. The other's is up, and it's not the player I started. Malcolm Brown scoring touchdowns, which you may not care about, but I do. And that's what Malcolm Brown did yesterday. Well, Greg, the mistake you made was not tying your running back to the better quarterback. Obviously, <laughs> you had to go with Malcolm Brown here. But Malcolm Brown, which is kind of weird given that I just said I don't care about touchdowns, and most of the reason we're talking about Malcolm Brown is because of touchdowns, but hey, whatever. Contradictions are going to happen. But the, the role for Malcolm Brown in week one was really, really good. Because we talked about this a lot in uh, redraft season. We were talking about Zach Moss. We want to get running backs who get high leverage targets. We want goal line touches. We want targets. And Malcolm Brown, I think you could have assumed the goal line touches, but the targets were really, really surprising, at least for me. He had four targets in their game on Sunday night against the Cowboys. He also had three carries inside the 10-yard line. Cam Akers had just one. Malcolm Brown had two carries inside the five and did convert both into touchdowns. So that's really good. 18 carries, four targets, a 60% snap rate. That's a very legitimate role for an offense that can definitely put some points in the board. Didn't score a ton on Sunday night, but there were times where they looked pretty solid. So honestly, I didn't ever think I would get to Malcolm Brown in daily fantasy for this year because I didn't expect him to have yardage upside. So you can get two touchdowns, but that's 12 points. Who cares? I want upside out of my backs, but now if he's going to get 18 carries and four targets, that's a totally different discussion. So Malcolm Brown's, I think he just suddenly becomes 
relevant for DFS, whereas that was not the case before. He is $5,200 week number two. He's on the road against Philadelphia, a really good defensive line. It is on the road. That's definitely something to keep, to keep in mind. But I think that he definitely becomes in play because of the role the Rams gave him in week number one. We want high leverage touches for running backs. Those are in the passing game. Those are near the goal line. Brown got both of those on top of other carries outside of that. So I think until that goes away, Malcolm Brown is very much on the DFS radar. Two touchdowns. Who cares about those 12 points? I do, Jim. I care about those 12 points. Yes, the 60% uh, snap rate was awesome, and all those 18 carries was great. But those touchdowns, they also matter. Like you said, those high-leverage situations where Malcolm Brown will be in there, that's what's going to make him valuable in redraft and in DFS. Just a tad over $5,000 this week on FanDuel. And it's an interesting play against a Philly team that also allowed some touchdowns to a running back not so great in Peyton Barber. So when you initially sent me this email this morning and you were saying, hey, here's the players I want to talk about, I had to double check who sent it because I was pretty sure it was JJ that sent me that we're going to chat about Logan Thomas today. But it wasn't. It was you, Jim. And it's Logan Thomas season, the former quarterback. He's been touting him for years as this tight end and as a sleeper tight end here this year. Well, Jordan Reed is gone from Washington. Vernon Davis is gone from Washington. Logan Thomas is the starter, and he matters both in season long and in DFS. Follow that money, Greg. The, the Washington football team gave Logan Thomas quite a bit of money in the offseason, and they talked him up for the entirety of training camps. So there's a reason J.J. was on this guy, and we saw it play out with a really good role in week number one. Logan Thomas led the team with eight targets and 72 air yards. He played 74% of the snaps, according to Pro Football Focus, and ran a route on 30 of their 36 pass plays. When you add all that up, I mean, obviously Terry McLaurin is the number one pass catcher in this offense, but Logan Thomas, easily the number two pass catcher in this offense. And sure, Washington's not the best team, but if you can get that out of a tight end, if you can get eight or so targets out of a tight end, I don't really care what offense he is in. He's going to have DFS relevancy. I also like that Thomas did get downfield targets because I want some path to yardage upside out of my tight ends. I don't want Jimmy Graham type guys who are going to get me maybe 25 yards and maybe stumble into the end zone. I want guys who can get yardage and get the touchdowns. And Logan Thomas, based on his usage on Sunday, showed me that's within his range of outcomes. He is $4,700 in week number two. He'll have to deal with Isaiah Simmons, so maybe not necessarily the best matchup, but $4,700 for a tight end who has a legitimate role and is likely the number two guy in his passing offense. I can accept maybe not a great matchup in that situation. So Logan Thomas, the offseason hype justified here, and he's someone we want to keep on buying even as his stock goes up and people start to buy in on him because it's the reason they're buying in is fully legitimate and something I'd expect to stick around as the year continues. Logan Thomas, a major part of this Washington offense alongside Terry McLaurin, a favorite target of Dwayne Haskins. And if that continues, well, you're going to be really happy you listened to JJ this past offseason. And it wasn't just Logan Thomas, Jim. I know we're not talking about Josh Kelly, but I texted JJ after this. I was like, this is your dream come true. And he's like, my pants have been in the corner all day. And I'm like, this sounds right. And with that, that's going to do it for today's hurry up. Jim Sonis, I appreciate the time, man. Good luck this week. Thank you, Greg. I hope you had a fantastic week at one. I'm looking forward to you to talking about week two on Friday. Absolutely. If I can make it to week two and don't pull my hair out during Monday Night Football, and as you would normally respond, at least you have the hair to pull out. Thank you. <laughs> Tom Becky will join me tomorrow right here on The Hurry. So please watch. For Jim Sonis, I'm Greg Sussman. We'll be back here tomorrow. Enjoy Monday Night Football, everybody.